Okay, so, um, so now it's time for the Scottish perspective. It was nice to hear this morning in the keynotes them say that Scotland was ahead of England. I was like, yes, score. So I'm going to talk about how hopefully demonstrate some of that. Um, I wasn't sure, I'm never sure when I'm not talking in Scotland how many people have heard of SCARF, the Scottish Archaeological Research Framework, so, or indeed have heard of the Society of Antiquaries, of which SCARF is a technically a research project of the antiquaries. Um, I like these just because they're nice pictures. These are the antiquaries of old. Um, um, so it's founded in 1780. Um, and the reason that I'm even bothering to go into this history is I think it's important to outline from the beginning that SCARF is a research project of the antiquaries and the antiquaries are an independent body. We're not funded by government, we're not related to government. Um, we get our funding mainly from fellows' subscriptions. Um, fellows in the past have included Sir Walter Scott, um, who, uh, along with the other antiquarians, collected a whole load of stuff. We won't go into how they collected it or why or where from. <coughs> <laughs> put it in uh, what became the National Museum of Scotland um, uh, because it basically collected so much and needed somewhere to put it that's a museum then um, I will take off my antiquaries hat and say it's much better then than it is now, kind of empty but still worth a visit if you go to Edinburgh um, but the point of this is that the antiquarian collections were gifted to the nation so that the society has always had um, its aim of informing the nation, whether they're fellows or not, about the archaeology and history of Scotland. Um, I was aware that I'd be at the end of the day, so I thought I'd put some things in to brighten it up. What does antiquary mean to you? Um, these pictures are great. These are one of the old keepers of archaeology. Um, another forefront Scotland thing is we the museum has just appointed its first lady keeper of Scottish history and archaeology ever, which is long overdue. Um, these are antiquarians now. Uh, you might recognise some of that. In the top hat is our director, Dr Simon Gilmore, who I'll talk about in a bit. Um, these are some, well, some people. <laughs> no, no, these are some of our illustrious fellows and uh, eminent archaeologists. Um, as I said, we're governed by a voluntary council, run by a small staff, and most importantly for this talk today, our funding is independent. Um, so we can say what we like, technically, though <laughs> um, we are being watched. Uh, we, it also means that one of the main things the society does is advocate on behalf of the heritage sector, uh, not just archaeology, but quite a, a big part of it. Um, we are supposed to simulate discussion and things in, in the sector about all sorts of things. I'm whizzing over this because it's, it's not directly related. Uh, the society is probably best known for its publications, which include the Proceedings of the Society of the PSAS uh, and their monographs. And it was really interesting to hear uh, the talk earlier about um, how things are feeding into, going to feed into new oases. Um, the society does a lot of advocacy. Um, a lot of what Gillen was just saying, we respond to government consultations, we produce statements, chair meetings, and most of all, we're supposed to be impartial. Um, that's it. Ms. Chow? Uh, this is uh, the Fiona Hislop, the culture secretary, who got mentioned in the talk this morning. So, on to the main thing. Uh, the society funds research projects. It does this through a system of, or a combination rather, of grants um, and we also help people get funding, we do prizes. SCARF, um, of which I'm project manager, is technically a society research project. Um, I should have that, sorry. SCARF is um, the research framework for the whole of Scotland. So um, earlier on we heard about the English regional ones and plans for those. Uh, SCARF does the whole of Scotland as one region, which, well, it, it has in the past done the whole of Scotland as one region. In the future, we've got plans for more regional frameworks, but all you need to know at the moment is that um, is designed and always has been designed to be updatable, um, highlighting um, the current state of knowledge of all of Scotland's past, right from the Paleolithic to the present day. Um, and it, this was done by a panel of experts and it was peer reviewed, things like that. Um, these are the SCARF panels. Um, it's just to illustrate this, you probably can't see that, the time periods that they cover. Um, and my question earlier was, was because the mo you can see here, the seven period panels go from Paleolithic to, to modern, post-medieval. And then there are two that don't cover any periods specifically, um, the Broad Church of Science <laughs> and Marine and Maritime. Um, so I thought I'd go on to a bit about the history of SCARF, just um, because I think it will be useful for those in England we're thinking about research frameworks, or and, and this is probably not why Dan's run away. <laughs> um, but also, um, this talk isn't really to showcase how brilliant I think SCARF is or where it does well. It's more to talk about 
how the, the sort of how it got to be how it is and possibly what you shouldn't do or what you should do differently and just things to think about. Um, it's more about the blood, sweat and tears involved in making it than it is about showing how great it is. So um, in, we're in 2016 now. The idea for Scarf actually began in 2007. Um, the society um, aim, well, oh, I'll just come to um, the aims and objectives in 2007, they were thought that it would, SCARF would provide a structure for Scotland which would reflect areas and resources because I think the realisation was at that time that, that there wasn't going to be much money in the future and things needed to be targeted. Um, but also, the more academic side, it was provide a series of aspirational goals, I really hate that phrase, um, to help research Scotland's past. But it was outlined in those minutes of the Army Steering Group that it would have a strong academic basis. Um, it was thought as well in 2007 that the final form of the research framework would be uh, a published book, much like the proceedings. Um, that there might be a web page to tell people about it. Uh, there might be one of these blog things, this is 2007, remember, um, but that the society would maybe possibly have a forum on its fellows page, which was a password protected part of the website. So straight away you can see a couple of things with that. Um, they didn't think the web would be a big deal in disseminating the, the ideas and the research, and also that um, the forum for discussion would be restricted to fellows of the society, and there's about three and a half thousand of them, but that's no, nowhere near representative of who would be using the framework, or is it? Um, in 2007, this is just a list of names, I'm not going to read them out, the first steering group, um, and you can see from the abbreviations, hopefully they make sense, I'd have to change them all anyway, wouldn't I? But, um, you can see from this that it is quite an academic um, makeup. There's hardly anybody there representing commercial or local authority interests. Yes, algae are represented, but in one thing, um, the guard representation is also from the university, um, as, is, as is the other commercial unit there, CFA. So that was in 2007. This is our director. Um, you can read this for yourself. But basically, it's to highlight again, this is in their official funding bid uh, to create SCARF, that the emphasis was on academic research. Um, it doesn't mention commercial, it doesn't mention local authorities. So it took a long time from people talking about starting this research framework to getting funding to actually employing someone as a project manager. Um, the first project manager started in 2008, so it's almost a year and a half after they first started talking about the need for a research framework for Scotland. I like to think, I like this picture because it just shows a mishmash of archaeological periods and things and a pile of stuff on the desk, which is how I like to think that the previous project manager had to deal with things. Um, he had the unenviable task of bringing the steering group vision to reality and the steering group um, had thought this is the kind of people who would use a research framework, a, a national research framework. Um, I, the, the emphasis on academics is, is mine, um, just to show that in the beginning people thought it would involve all these groups, including commercial and volunteers, government bodies, museum curators, but that, yeah, sorry, that kind of is mine. When you look, for example, at the final authors of the panel reports, you can see that well, you should be able to see. For example, for the Roman period, only 4% of people worked in commercial archaeology, um, which isn't, I would argue, an equal representation like the steering group would thought it would represent there. Um, yeah, the only exception, um, the only exception to non-commercial things was um, the Marine and Maritime Panel Report, where there was a massive, nearly 30% of people involved in creating that report came from, um, or at the time were working in a commercial unit or background. Uh, the call for papers for this session suggested that uh, the situation for archaeological institutions and individuals in the public and non-commercial sectors remains challenging. Um, one would, you could argue, the figures I've shown suggest the opposite, that actually it's the academic sector doing fine here, and the commercial sector is the one that's being challenged if they're not being included in writing the frameworks. These are just um, an acknowledgement of all the people that were involved in SCARF. There were over 320 people involved in the panel reports altogether, um, some said more than others, obviously. Um, but 
most of them are from academia. Um, these are some statistics from making up the panel report. So how, what I wanted to talk about now was how were these 320 odd people given one voice? The, the research framework for Scotland is supposed to represent Scottish archaeology's <coughs> story and it's supposed to outline the knowledge at the time and research recommendations about how, how on earth do you do 320 different people? How do you give them one voice? Do you give them one voice? So there's been thousands, literally thousands of contact hours in writing and editing time. So I was just going to go into how rep each report was made up. Each report is made up of about 20,000 words of text um, summarising the state of knowledge at the moment, about 5,000 words of recommendations for the future. Each report also includes case studies, images that come from a range of sources, uh, the Royal Commission, the National Museum, the National Library, uh, and as well as individual authors. And it was also envisioned that it would be comments from panel members old and new. Um, it was thought at the time, and we're, we're still talking sort of 2008 here, that SCARF would be read like a traditional publication. These 20,000 word reports that people wrote would be um, a hardback publication available to read in a library. Um, as I said, there might be one web page, but you know that would be it. Um, the 21st century kicked in at some point and somebody, and I still can't track who or nobody's putting their hand up to it, suggested that um, maybe we could have these reports as PDFs to download. And it's like, but from what I can gather, it would be the same as the book, the same as the published book, I'll, I'll call it book, but just downloadable online. Um, and then it didn't take until 2011, so four years after the project started, that they thought we should have a website of its own, it should have a wiki. Um, I started with Scarf in 2011, um, and my first job was to create this wiki and put everything online. The proper geeks amongst us will realise that Scarf is not a true wiki. It is a wiki-style website. Um, I can go into that later if you want, but in case you've not seen it, uh, this is what Scarf looks like. It has colour images. That might not be a big deal to some people, but some of our 220 authors we're still quite bemused by the fact that we said there is no limit on the amount of images you have, there is no limit, it, it doesn't cost any more, it's fine. So if you look at some of the panel reports, some of them have the amount of images you might expect in an expensive to print book and some of them are better. Uh, this is too small to see, but if you go to bibliographic references and text and hover over it, you get the whole um, extracts, you don't even have to break your reading. Uh, there's links throughout, uh, it's too small, where archaeological sites are mentioned in the text. Um, you can link to the Canmore record. You can tell us it's an old screenshot, but there you go. Um, you can link straight to the Canmore record. Um, so the, I, the reason that it went online was partly due to an acknowledgement of the rising cost of publication, but also the need to update the framework in the future. Um, these are just some of the things we can do. You can embed video, you can have maps. Comments. Oh, I'll say that. Yeah, uh, the realization, and I think about 2010, that people might want to update this framework fairly regularly meant that a traditional publication wouldn't be on the cards. Um, if you go with this wiki thing that it went with before, and you still can actually, you can register with the website, you can get a username and password, and you can add to the text, but you can't update the main text, it just get add, gets added as a comment. Um, this is a whole talk in itself, but the comments bit hasn't been used. I've spoken to Dan about why I don't think that the new English regional one should bother with a comment section, um, because either you get crazy people, <laughs> sort of like Brit art, or you get <laughs> you get people who are too who have a valid point to make, but are too afraid to make it in a public forum where their name will be attached to it, because. A lot of the people, um, there's been quite a lot of people who've emailed Scarf and said, oh, I'd love to comment on this section of the Neolithic, but um, my idea's a bit crazy and I don't know if anyone will believe me. I'm just a PhD student, and I'll come on to that later, but um, it's, people are basically, the peer pressure is too much. The comments facility's not really being used. Um, so the final form of publication, I suspect, has altered the way in which the resource has been used. The Scarf user survey, um, that Dan alluded to earlier um, was carried out in late 2015 and there was about 100 people answered so I didn't have to do much sums to get my percentages um, 
and we asked people how they use SCARF, what they use it for and why. Um, this slide shows the various ways in which SCARF has been cited um, using, da using data from our survey. And you can see that journal articles, oh, don't mind pointing here, journal articles and conference papers do feature quite highly, but also, I don't know if you can read it, that more surprisingly perhaps, or would have been surprising to the original um, senior group of SCARF was that DSRs, catalogues, PERDs, WSIs, and EIAs have also used SCARF. Um, in other words, commercial work, and commercial work, again, when SCARF was designed primarily to be an academic framework, that's quite interesting in how it's being used. People also use SCARF for funding bids. Now, um, I can't say at the moment, not that I won't say, I can't say because I don't know, um, how many of these bids have been successful, um, but the fact that the resource has been used for funding is interesting in itself. Um, SCARF is also being used to help shape other research frameworks. So at the moment, um, and hopefully be published this summer, there is a nationwide Car Stones research framework um, organised by Stirling and Glasgow University, so arguably academically they are having commercial input. Um, this is going to be part of SCARF, much like a panel report, but that's a sort of academic, material, culture, object orientated thing. Um, there's also more regional frameworks coming out of SCARF. Um, Argyle was alluded to earlier for scrub, <laughs> uh, also um, because it's quite, an, you know, the whole area of Argyle um, is obviously archaeologically famous and important, but there's no, at the moment, research agenda for it. So Kilmartin Museum um, are at the middle of starting this regional research framework for the whole area. That's a partnership with um, it was Historic Scotland when they started funding it, now it's Historic Environment Scotland, Museums Gallery Scotland, the Council, the local authority archaeologists and SCARF and the Society. Um, there is also this Boyne to Brodgar one, which is a period specific framework for the Neolithic, but it's linking Scotland and Ireland, it's treating Scotland and Ireland as one archaeological region because they're so archaeologically similar. Um, Alison Sheridan and Gabriel Kinney are just ignoring the sea, which seems like a good idea, archaeologically. But that's a partnership with um, the Society, Commercial Units, AOC, um, Historic Environment Scotland, uh, and the University of Edinburgh. So again, that's joining up different ways of working in people. Uh, and also I thought, seeing as I'm here, we're talking this slide about Historic England, um, that their network of English regional frameworks, and the ones that Dan talked about this morning, that are going to be more regional, um, their call for papers, or no, Papers. Their call for um, updates to the framework last year alluded quite heavily to SCARF and making these ones um, similar to SCARF in the wiki. Uh, other things that SCARF has led to, sort of under the heading of future potential and unexpected things, SCARF um, was designed to be a research framework for academics, but it's led to a field school in Loch Torridon. Uh, that's up north, <laughs> probably up north. Um, that's uh, led by a collaboration between Wessex Archaeology, so a commercial unit, and the University in Barcelona. It's led to uh, a five-year research project, which <coughs> is a long time, um, based at the Old Commission uh, that came from the Marine Maritime Report. People are also choosing their PhDs based on SCARF research recommendations, like literally just going to a numbered recommendation, 3.7.1, I don't even know what that is, and I'm the manager, but someone's like, oh, I'm going to do my PhD on that. Brilliant. Um, unexpected things. Uh, can't we see the SQA, the exam board for Scotland, used SCARF as a source material for their higher history exam last year, which is <coughs> completely unexpected. Um, so for, for the future, um, at the moment we have SCARF funding again until March 2018. That's what that should say, not 17. I'm not doing it by then. Uh, we will update all nine panel reports, all seven period ones, and marine and science work on that's already started. If anybody has any Scottish data wants to get involved, let me know. Um, we're also starting a new project uh, in June. We've got a new person, I won't be alone anymore, um, who's going to work with museums collections and highlight research gaps for those in two pilot areas. That's Aberdeenshire and Orkney. Um, and also the SCARF Student Network, um, which is open to not just Scottish students, I thought I'd flag it up, anybody who that has Scottish case studies or works in Scotland can share their research. And this slide is just to show about knitting it all together. I hope it's shown, well, I hope it's shown that it is possible
for the disparate worlds of archaeology to come together um, and create a research framework for the whole nation, but that it does take a lot of work, a lot of contact hours, a lot of tears, a lot of arguing, um, but oh, that you do end up with lots of friends and lots of good research recommendations at the end of it. Um, so if anybody wants any of the gory details about how it, what it takes to make a research framework, um, you can get in touch with these myriad of ways. Um, I think probably I'm out of time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.